All right, Psalm 134. Psalm 134. This is the last of the songs of degrees, or some would call it the song of the steps. Because the children of Israel sang these songs as they ascended the steps up to the temple. The singer has now made his way to the top, and he's looking back at where he's came from. He can go no higher. There's nothing between him and the Savior. He has his feet planted step by step on higher ground. And now he's at the top. Spiritually, he's far above the place where he was when he began with woe is me in Psalm 120. He burst out into an ecstatic, bless the Lord. It's worth taking a look at the way in which he ascended. We pause for a moment with this singer. We see the ascending flights of stairs, which have brought him to this high point. These songs of degrees can be divided into three different groups of five. First, he's seen down at the bottom looking up. He is beholding the Lord in Psalms 120 through 124. Psalm 120, the psalmist was groaning. He was very low down. He was bewailing his distress. Everything was dark and depressing. He was a defeated man. But in Psalm 121, he began to make his way upward. He left that low-lying step where his feet felt like lead and his soul were in despair. The psalmist is no longer groaning in distress. Now he's glancing. He has his eyes on the hills. Remember Psalm 121, he says, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. When an artist paints a picture, one of his concerns is composition. Photographers do it as well. Composition. Everything in the picture points to the focal point. I guess that's why my photography was never really all that good. I've often envied artists and painters because they can they can create, if you will, their pictures to look the way they want them to. The photographer can only capture what's there. Now, through the use of software, you can, you can make changes and add things and take things away, but then it's no longer a photograph, it's, it's art. In Psalm 122, we see the singer now is seeing glorying. He said, I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Although God's throne was on high, in his condescending grace, he also had a seat on earth, there in the temple, behind the veil, between the cherubims, on top of the sacred ark, the Shekinah cloud would enthrone upon the mercy seat. The thought of Jerusalem as God's earthly dwelling filled this singer's soul with exultation. God was not remote, far away. He was here to meet with his people. And the singer was filled with joy and exultation. In Psalm 123, the fourth step, the singer could be seen gazing. The, the glance can save, but it's the gaze that sanctifies. There was, a, there was life for a look. It reminds me of when the children of Israel had sinned and God sent those fiery serpents. And what did God tell Moses? He said, make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole and lift that pole up. And when the children of Israel look at that serpent, they shall live. That's where we get the premise of the song that I don't remember if it's in these hymn books or not, but look and live. That's what it's talking about. It's referring to that passage of scripture in Psalm 125. We see dangers. Are, were minimized. It says, as the mountains were round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. 
No foe can harm us. No fear alarm us. We're on the victory side. Psalm 126, dreams are realized. Psalm 126 tells us, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Think about how Job felt when the Lord restored him. No more pain, no more poverty, no more persecutions, no more problems. The wonder of his restoration was so great, Job might have thought he was only dreaming. The psalmist puts his dangers in perspective, realizing that those who sowed in tears would reap in joy. In Psalm 127, dreams were realized. The singer had a deep desire to become a fruitful man, to have the joy of seeing sons born in the home. He realized that this could not be accomplished in the energy of the flesh. He said, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. He made it a matter of believing prayer that God would reward him with fruit. In Psalm 128, delights were multiplied. He embraced the joy of being a fruitful person. He saw children as olive plants around his table. His faith rang out, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. In Psalm 129, dreads were crucified. He arrived at the top of the second flight of steps. And again, just as when he arrived at the top of the first flight, he almost slips. He thought of the afflictions he'd experienced on his pilgrimage. He said, many a time, many a time. But before he could slip and slide all the way back to the bottom, he took a fresh look at God's grip on him. The Lord is righteous, he said. His dreads were crucified. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Having successfully ascended two significant flights of steps, the psalmist was ready for the third and final ascent. Now we see him blessing the Lord. I almost ask you to sing that tonight. I can't remember it. Bless the Lord, oh, bless the Lord, oh, bless his holy name. Yeah, I won't sing it. That was terrible. He, in Psalm 130, the psalmist sang of the pardon of the Lord. He said, if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? We shall never climb so high that we are beyond the need for pardon. The higher we get, the more we see the wickedness of our own evil hearts. Paul could describe himself in his day, before he was born again, a Hebrew of Hebrews in Philippians 3 verse 5. But later on, he describes himself as one who came not a whit behind the very chiefest of apostles in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 5. Later still, he was less than the least of all saints in Ephesians 3 verse 8. In the end, he called himself the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1 15, and not meet to be called an apostle, 1 Corinthians 15 9. It was not that the apostle was backsliding. It was that he was climbing higher and higher. And the closer he got to God, the more he saw who he really was. We have way too high estimation of ourselves. In Psalm 131, the singer told us of the patience of the Lord. He describes himself as a weaned child. He thought of that wonderful God who treated him the way a loving mother treats her child. In Psalm 132, he sang of the promises of the Lord. He held God to his covenant word to David, that David should never lack a descendant to sit on his throne. And he received the Lord's prompt answer that he had not forgotten. Psalm 133, he sang of the people of the Lord and told aloud the wondrous story of their unity and blessing. Life forevermore, he exclaimed. Well, unity, we need that in our day and hour. And now he arrives at the top. In Psalm 134, he sings of the power of the Lord. It's a note he has struck twice before in this series. Bless ye the Lord that made heaven and earth. He has come a long way from that first faltering step taken with fear and trembling, but with hope in his heart. We're now ready to bless the Lord. 
which is what this short psalm is all about. It's what we shall be doing for all eternity, blessing, praising, and worshiping the Lord who has done great things for us. This final psalm of the series divides into two parts. The first part we see in verses 1 to 2, we see the Ren, the ren, yeah, the rendering blessing to the Lord. Look at Psalm 134, verses 1 and 2. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Hmm. Somebody lifts a hand in the service. What do we think? They're charismatic. I mean, the, the church I grew up in, I love that church. I still love that church to this day. But oh, we, we don't do that. We need to get over that. Let's, as we think about rendering blessing to the Lord. It's we who are God's servants who have, who are best equipped to lift our hands and praise Him. Think about him for a minute, a man who's tone deaf. He's sitting at a concert. He really can't appreciate things going on around him. He's listening to the sounds, but he can't appreciate it. He can't appreciate what everybody's getting out of it. But for the sake of appearances, he might pretend to be enjoying the performance. No doubt the movement and rhythm, the color of the costumes, the bright and shining instruments, the scenery, the draperies might please him. But the full beauty of the music, it escapes him. Kind of like me. Got no rhythm, can't dance. That's why I'm a Baptist preacher. The souls of an unsaved person are not tuned in to worship. They don't know anything about worship. They can raise a hand. They can shout. They can run. But they really don't understand what they're doing. They definitely do not understand the one that they are supposed to be worshiping. Worship is the prerogative of those people, those eternal souls who have been genuinely born again. That is the qualification of worship. And the only qualification. The second part of verse 1 he tells us when. He says, Ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Not just servants, church, but sentinels. In the first year of his reign, Hezekiah opened the doors of the temple, which had been closed for some time. And, and I'm not sure. I didn't dig into it to find out why. But the doors of the, had been closed, and Hezekiah opens them. And he commands that... They sanctify themselves, the priests and the Levites. He says, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him. Second Chronicles 29, 11. The great Passover was kept. And again, we read of the priests and the Levites. They, the Bible tells us, stood in their place after their manner according to the law of Moses. Second Chronicles 30, verse 16. When the Passover was over, there was a general house cleaning throughout the cities of Judah. Idols were taken down and destroyed. Shrines were demolished. Then the Bible tells us Hezekiah appointed the courses of the priests and the Levites after their courses to minister and to give thanks in the gates. Second Chronicles 31 and verse 2. Everything was done decently and in order. Every man had his place and his function. The porters were sentinels. And I thought this was interesting. They were appointed to guard the gates. They were Levites who might have thought themselves low down on the scale of things. But like the priests, they were descendants of Levi. But unlike the priests, 
They were not anointed to serve in holy things. That does not mean that they were lesser. It means they had a different ministry that was assigned to them. They were entrusted with work around the temple. They were not assigned to the temple choir. Their job was to stand at the gates as watchmen. They might have felt that theirs was not a very significant job. But the porters mentioned in this psalm were the night watchmen. Very few people saw what they did. But their service, their service was essential. The sentinel's job was to guard the gate. He was to stand there and keep a watchful eye on everything that came in or out of the city. They were to make sure nothing, not one single thing that was not allowed in that holy city made it through those gates because they did not want to see God be displeased. Let me read for you some verses out of Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 to 22. I think that'll bring this thought home for us. The Bible tells us, Nehemiah 13, verse 15, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, also as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre, also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. It came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gate that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. We should be that zealous about worshiping God. It's too easy to let the world in. That's why we don't have smoke bombs on the platform. We don't have disco lights in the ceiling. We don't, we don't play ungodly music. We don't allow ungodly music played in here. Why? Because this is the sanctuary where we worship the living God. It is not a freak show like some churches have turned themselves into in this day and hour. We are here to worship God. So this watchman had a very important task. They were responsible to see that the city was kept undefiled and be a befitting place where God's chosen could dwell. Hmm. A lot of parallels to modern day in this stuff. The sentinels whom Hezekiah urges to praise and bless the Lord are those who watched by night. The post might have been a lively one during the day. It was a lonely one at night. Man, third shift. Whew. I'm telling you. I guess I'm out of the business now. Unfortunately, I got more sleep on late shift than I ever should have. Three o'clock in the morning is the most deadly time of the day. I don't know why, but at three o'clock, it's like your body says, good night. The people I worked with knew at three o'clock I was going to take a walk. When I, when I, if I worked with somebody, like, oh, three o'clock, David, time for your walk. <laughs> what? Okay, I'm out. You know, <laughs> let me get woke up here before I <laughs> the sleep out of my eyes. But there was something different about these sentinels 
Because as they stood their night watch, not only could they keep their watch, they could commune with God. So can we. I mean, all of those years, I, would, I used to take my Bible and I would read my Bible and if it was really not exciting enough, I might actually study. Believe it or not, there have been sermons written in the Speedway Police Department in the dispatch center. I can't say that they were that great, but God's work went on. Just like it was in this day. During these night watches, that sentinel could worship God. In all of that quietness, it was just them and God. Then we see where in the last part of verse 1 and verse 2, he says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord in the sanctuary. The singer here is thinking of those who are afar off, cut off from God, born in unblessed lands, raised to worship idols and to embrace fierce ideologies. And here were the Levites standing in the temple courts entrusted by the Lord with special service, with a post of danger and responsibility. Their task was to take care of things during the night, a post of rare trust. Yet, so faithless and restless is the human heart that these men had to be exhorted. We see the ever-present danger of becoming familiar with holy things. And that is one thing that I try as a pastor to guard against, even today in El Bethel Baptist Church. You may think that there's no rhyme or reason to why I do things, and sometimes there's not a rhyme or a reason. Sometimes it's just I want to break things up a little bit. It's not that I'm so fly by night and so flighty that I'm like, oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do that. No, 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 no. I'm trying to kill monotony. I get sick and tired of, well, we come to church, we sing three songs, we take up the offering, we say our bless the Lord, we pray and go home. What worship is there in that? I can tell you what worship is in that. Nothing. It's dead routine. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, he tells us in verse 2. To lift up one's hands was a symbolic gesture that showed three things. First, it showed that the hands are clean. The hands are clean. As David said in Psalm 24, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands. God does not insist that our hands be clever, but He does insist that they be clean. Those that handle holy things are not required to pass an aptitude test or even have a degree in theology. Thank the Lord. But we're required to be pure and to be clean. Defiled and dirty people are barred from sanctuary service. In the temple. Hands were secondly to be lifted to show that hands are complete. In the law book of Israel, detailed instructions were given to service in the sanctuary. The priest and the Levites were occupied with holy things, with the things of God. We could use a little revival of that in our day and hour, couldn't we? We get so preoccupied with everything except the things of God. And I know, I know it's easy to fall into that trap. But the Bible still says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. What? All of these things shall be added unto you. If we put God first, guess what? He'll take care of the rest of it. The New Testament principle is, is the same. It's not physical disability that now that, that keeps a person from service, but there's still things that are prohibitive. Third, the hands were lifted to show that they were consecrated. A man lifting up his hands in the sanctuary would either hold up hands that were empty 
and thus available to be filled and used, or his hands had some implement in them necessary for the work of God. We cannot serve God if our hands are already full of other things. That's why he says, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Because you see, if my hands are full of my care and burdens, then I'm not casting my care upon him and letting him handle it. And besides that, it ties up my hands and prevents me from doing service that God would have me to do with my hands. The remainder of the psalm shows us the other side of the coin, if you will. No one can render blessing to the Lord without, number two, receiving blessing from the Lord. Verse 3. Verse 3 tells us, The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. In this last verse, the psalmist makes mention of the first part of verse 3, the Lord's ability. He made heaven and earth. Here we see from whence our assurance comes. Our assurance. No wonder this is the top step in this series. We're to bless the Lord who what? Made heaven and earth. Every sun and star in space, every blade of grass, every stick and stone on earth. He made them all. That's why the psalmist urges us to bless the Lord. He doesn't ask us here to serve Him, but to bless Him, to worship Him. Not only the Lord's ability, but the Lord's abode in the last part of verse 3. The Lord hath made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. That tells us from whence our answers come. Our answers come from Zion. Out of the place where the Lord had put His name. It's impossible to bless God without having Him bless us. The God who has the genius to create a galaxy and who has the grace to come and live among His people is a God who knows how to bless us. What more can we ask than that? Nothing. Nothing. He blesses us. Why don't we bless Him? I think oftentimes we get to we get our focus wrong. Like the Apostle Peter when he stepped out of the boat. I mean, he was the one that stepped out of the boat. But the Bible says he took his he took his eyes off Jesus and put his eyes on the storm, and then what? He began to sink. And I think if we would really focus on how blessed we are, I think we'd spend a little more time blessing the Lord. And let's be honest, we're blessed far above and beyond what we deserve. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this reminder of how you have so incredibly blessed us.